Hey, great to be with you. We're all about the big issues on this show, and the biggest issue of all is free speech, which is in deep trouble around the Western world. You might disagree on that, and you might say, oh, no, 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 the biggest issue is Islam, the biggest issue is sexual identity politics, the biggest issue is climate change. But if you don't have free speech, you can't even address all those other issues, which is exactly the way they want it. And on the issues I've enumerated, and a lot more, increasingly there is an official position, and if you disagree with that official position, people will come after you, they will ruin your life, they will end your career, they will get you fired from your job, and if necessary, they will attempt to criminalize your opinion. So, for example, Hit Wilders, an opposition politician in the Netherlands, has been convicted, in essence, over his party's immigration policy, over a political difference. A court has criminalized his political opinions. In the United States, if you happen to host a home decorating show on a cable channel, but you attend a church that's not fully on board with gay marriage, they will come after you and demand that your network disown you or get rid of you or force you in order to continue hosting your home decorating show uh, to sign up to the party line on gay marriage. In Australia, the country's national newspaper has had its editorial cartoonist taken to the Human Rights Commission for a cartoon expressing his view on a matter of political debate. Increasingly, there is an official ideology and a prudent person does not question it and keeps his head down. Uh, the latest battleground is gender politics. Until the day before yesterday, there were two sexes. That was a biological fact, a scientific fact. But it turns out, to coin a phrase, the science isn't settled, and there are no longer two sexes, just multiple genders. Uh, here's a quick example from a Daily Mail headline in London. Don't call pregnant patients mothers. Doctors are banned from using the word over fears it will upset those who are transgender. The official guidelines issued by the British Medical Association says mothers-to-be should be referred to as pregnant people. Uh, but wait a minute, isn't a pregnant person by definition a mother-to-be? Oh, don't be so ridiculous. We now have, in Oregon and England and elsewhere, pregnant men, like this bloke. That's Hayden Cross, who started out as a girl, then became a boy, but doesn't see why that should cramp his maternal instincts. Paternal instincts, whatever. So he's now four months pregnant. And when he gives birth to the baby, he will presumably assume the role of the kid's dad. And so because of him and a handful of other pregnant males, uh, the British Medical Association says the word mother is now discriminatory and verboten. You can laugh at this, but nobody who matters in our society is laughing. And today we have with us a man who has become a lightning rod and is really in the fight of his life in Canada over this issue of free speech versus political correctness. Uh, he's come from the University of Toronto, uh, Professor Jordan Peterson. Great okay. to see you. Good to Thanks. see you too. And uh, jo Jordan, a lot of what you're going through is... Uh, is kind of familiar to me um, because I went through it uh, up in Canada a few years ago myself. But uh, for, the, for the benefit of non-Canadians, uh, just explain the moment uh, at which uh, this whole pit opened up for you. Well, it was on September 27th. I was sitting in my office at home and I decided to make some videos, release them on my YouTube channel. Um, I have put all my lectures on that YouTube channel for the last three years so that people can see them around the world, and quite a few people had been watching them. Um, I, I got wind of a bill, C-16, in Canada that purported to add gender identity and gender expression to the list of protected groups in Canada. I started to do some investigation into that, and I found that the, the legislation was instantiating a new definition of human identity into the, into the Canadian legal system and the, and the identity or the, the, um, the gender identity was predicated on the idea that there was no relationship between biological sex, gender identity and gender expression, that those things were completely independent. 
and that gender identity and gender expression were essentially a matter of subjective choice. Right. And there was also an injunction that required people to use these gender neutral pronouns. And uh, I found that objectionable, partly because I regard the gender neutral pronouns as part of the vanguard of a politically correct movement and felt that I wasn't going to use, if you use the language rules that your ideological opponent demands that you use, you cede the territory to them. Right. And we've been ceding the territory to politically correct authoritarians for a very long period of time. Well, and, and language is an important part of this battle, as uh, Orwell and many others uh, mm. have, have recognized. If they can impose uh, linguistic absurdities on you, you've basically agreed to live the official lie, as it were. Yes. Um, the battle is, in fact, about language, fundamentally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when you, you, when, when you talk about this gender pronoun thing, I mean, we didn't used to have a multiplicity of genders until 20 minutes ago, there were like two sexes, male, female. So pronoun-wise, you had he and she, uh, and now uh, you say there are these other pronouns that you, when you're with your students, are supposed to be using. Uh, yes, if I'm give, give us Give us I'm, an example of what these new pronouns are. Z and zer are, are common. Sometimes people want to be referred to as they, right. which sacrifices the distinction between the singular and the plural. Yeah, and was you, was traditionally the uh, prerogative of Her Majesty the Queen, right. but nobody else. <clears throat> exactly. And, 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 and this, is, this whole use of Z and Z is, is taken ser very seriously, very seriously. Yes, well, Bill C-16 changes the Human Rights Code and the Criminal Code to make discrimination on, on the grounds of gender identity or gender expression, part of the hate speech provisions. And uh, the failure to use the appropriate pronoun, that's the pronoun that's demanded of you, yeah. constitutes harassment and discrimination and, and can be prosecuted under the hate speech codes. Now, the people who've been debating me in Canada claim that that would never happen, but they're not to be trusted in my estimation. Right. Once you put something into the law, they put, they put it into the hate speech codes for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's no, not an no. accident. And, and my own experience of those commissions is that they always start out by saying, no, 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 this is just a mopping up operation for some, for a few people out on the wild extremist fringe. Don't worry about them. Don't pay any attention to them. And it always creeps inward, inward, inward. Uh, and, and whatever it was ever intended to address way out on the fringe, it actually winds up uh, ensnaring all kinds of people who aren't in the least bit on the fringe or extremist. Uh, well, I know that at the university there's al already been a chill placed over any discussions about the biological differences between men and women. Right. My own students, um, I'm a personality psychologist and so part of my field is gender differences in personality. And my students have already reported to me when they're serving as teaching assistants in their classes that they're very cautious about what sort of claims they make. And it looks to me that one of the law's consequences is that it will make discussions of the biological differences between men and women. It seems extreme to believe this, but it appears to me to make them illegal. Right, right. Which is, which is because the law, yeah. in, the law insists that your identity has no relationship to the underlying biology. And in no. fact, one of the people I debated, who was a University of Toronto professor, um, he claimed that the scientific consensus for the last four decades is that there was no biological differences between men and women. Right, right, which, which is, and it, it, this, this is interesting to me, because if you look at one of the other uh, controversial areas of speech, again, where they're trying to criminalize uh, dissent, in climate change, uh, the left says, oh, well, the right is anti-science because there's a scientific uh, body of uh, work and they're ignoring it. Whereas the argument is flipped on its head for biology. No one, no one when they're discussing uh, gender identity, says uh, we need to pay any attention to what biological science has to say mm -hmm. about it. Well, it's strange, too, because... It, it invalidates many of the left's own arguments. So, for example, with regards to transgender people, 
there's this idea that you can be a man born in a woman's body or vice versa. And obviously, that's a biologically predicated argument. Right. And now that they've switched identity to what's essentially subjective whim in the law, then it seems to me that the proper interpretation of transgender decisions is that it's a matter of choice. The law insists on yes. that. And it insists the same thing with regards to sexual um, orientation. Yes, again, it's this uh, using whatever argument works for you. I mean, the argument on sexual orientation is that it's, in, it's inherent so that it's, it's cruel uh, to make a man right. who's attracted to other men uh, go out and date women. Uh, it's because who he is cannot be changed. Right. In fact, the conversion therapy, so to speak, was banned yes. in, in Ontario on exactly those grounds. And that's exactly. basically a biologically predicated argument. But then when it comes to gender, we're now saying you can take any point on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. between, or off, or off, or the, off spectrum. the spectrum. Yes, yeah. because that's actually written into the policies. Right. You can be anywhere on the spectrum or nowhere right. between men and women. And um, that was one part of it that I particularly objected to because I really don't understand what it means to be off the spectrum. I don't believe that it's a spectrum to begin with. And, you have to use technical language when you're writing legislation. It's not a spectrum. It's a modified bi bimodal distribution, right? right? So there are feminine men, obviously, and masculine women, but they're a small proportion of the population. The bulk of the population stacks up at the, at the standard gender poles. And to be nowhere on the distribution, I guess that I'm not sure exactly what that means. It could be an error in writing, or it could be referring to these people that claim identities that aren't human. And that's yeah. the next frontier, as far as I can tell. They call them other kins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, pe people laugh at this yeah. when you explain it. When you talk about other kins, or when you say, I'm supposed to use Z and Zer and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. But nobody who matters in our society is laughing at this, mm -hmm. including your employers and your students and the government of Canada. They all take this stuff deadly seriously. Yes, well, I got two letters from the university warning me to stop making my, my public pronouncements that I would refuse to use these non-standard pronouns, even though the pronouns are fabrications and they haven't entered the common parlance. They've, they've been in, imposed, and that's a legislative novelty to impose a form of speech on someone. It's not a limit on your free speech. It's a demand that you use a certain kind of, in my estimation, ideologically motivated language, very ideologically motivated. And I've studied the development of totalitarianism for a very long time. Right. And one of the things I know is that, well, it's, it's the issue of ceding control over language. And so the government has carelessly made a precedent, and the precedent is compelled speech, essentially. Yeah, and, and abs absolutely disgraceful. As you said, this word didn't exist until the day well, before. Well, and there's yesterday. all sorts of words. There's yeah. not, and, and there's no agreement on which ones should be used. No, no. And people can also demand to be, to be addressed with one set of words one day and another set another day. That's the yeah. gender fluid types who claim to be me, me, men one day and women the next. Right, right. Um, the, the, the problem here for you, though, is that in the world in which you work, there is no support for the suggestion that you should be able to hold a contrary opinion on this. Well, there doesn't appear to be, and I, it's partly because the, the law in Ontario also demands that an employer is as responsible for his or her employee's speech as for his or her own speech. And so when I made the videos to begin with, I pointed out that making the video was probably illegal in and of itself, and that the University of Toronto would be held responsible for that. Right. And their lawyers obviously reviewed the video prior to sending me the warning letters and, and came to exactly the same conclusion. And so you, in, in Ontario now, as an employer, you can even be liable for the unintended and unreported consequences of your employee's speech. Right, right. Now, you're, you're not um, a person who, uh, by the standard definitions would be regarded as extreme right wing or uh, w would be way over on no, I think I'm, a I'm essentially a classic liberal right. you know in, in the old school sense I'm an individualist um, and, and and your and your basic position is you, if someone wants to decide they're an other kin that's fine for them but there's no absolutely no reason why 34 million other Canadians 
uh, should be compelled by law to accept that. Yes, well, that's it. I mean, there's this idea that using someone's pronoun is a mark of respect. You know, if I call you he, that's a mark of respect. And, and that what I'm doing by not using these pronouns on demand is showing lack of respect for someone. And I don't, don't buy that argument at all. There's nothing more generic than referring to someone by the pronoun, and you basically do it based on, their, based on a casual assessment of their appearance. Right. Um, no one has the right to, to impose their interpretation of their own identity on someone else. I mean, even children know that, right? Children have to negotiate a game if they want to play it with other people. Yeah. At least children who've been properly socialized know right. that. Right. And this is, in actual fact, a kind of desocialization. Yeah, absolutely. Where normal social relations are, uh, are replaced by ever more complex state mediation between mm. different power groups. By subjective whim enforced by state power, right. fundamentally. Right. Yeah. Now, when you <clears throat> say this to your students, what, are, what do they think? Uh, guys who are like 18, 19, 20. Well, I don't know yet exactly because I, I wasn't teaching undergraduates this semester. Right. I start again next semester. I mean, I, I've taught a couple of sections on gender differences over the years. Um, one of the surprising findings in, in, the stu in, the, in the field of personality is that so there's been studies of human personality conducted all across the world. Right. And psychologists have settled on a standard model that has five dimensions, five personality dimensions. And, then have looked for differences between men and women across countries. And the, the crucial test was the Scandinavian countries because the Scandinavians have done a lot to flatten out the sociological landscape for men and women. And right. The consequence of that has actually been that the differences between men and women in Scandinavia have got larger, <laughs> not only in terms of personality, right. but also in terms of interest. And interest yeah. is, men tend to be interested in things and women tend to be interested in people. And there's some decent evidence that thing interest is mediated by testosterone exposure in utero, which right. sounds pretty biological when right, things right, considered. Right, and, right. and, you know, I've made the claim that in my classes that I don't buy the distinction between sex and, and gender, which was invented by John Money yeah. back in 1955, a single theorist, yeah. and whose ideas I think were quite badly discredited, uh, especially by his involvement in the Johns Hopkins Gender Reassignment Clinic, which shut down just a few years ago. Yeah. That was his baby and they decided that gender reassignment surgery was a well, catastrophe. Yes, I, I mean, this, and yet it is becoming ever more state-imposed because we have situations now um, in Australia and the United Kingdom where children are taken away from their parents, grade school children, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, if the parents don't want to go along with the, uh, the gender reassignment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, there was one gender reassignment clinic for children several years ago and now and the person who started that has now is now running 43 right. and in Canada um, if a child at school decides to use the alternate pronoun to adopt a different gender identity the schools are forbidden to tell the parents right. so and yes increasingly they're doing gender reassignment on children who are, so, who are very young and so again it's uh, it's part of the state's appropriation of their the parental role the parents don't get to have a say. If, if, if the seven-year-old boy decides he wants to be a seven-year-old girl, the parents uh, are sidelined in, in whether the boy gets to do that. Basically. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is, which is uh, wicked and totalitarian. Yes, yes. Well, you know, you might want to leave the knives and the hormones for later in life. I mean, Ken Zucker, who was at, the, uh, at Toronto's big hospital for, for the mentally ill, he, was a, he worked on gender dysphoria. And his basic proposition was that you should wait because most people who, are, who have gender dysphoria when they're young decide that they're homosexual. Right. But about 90% of them settle into their biological identity by the time they're adults. And, his, his, and so his tack was to wait and see. And they scuttled his career, fired him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, because of this... Uh, opposition to uh, essentially an official ideology yep. that didn't exist uh, until the day before yesterday. Right, exactly. Now, when I, when I had my difficulties uh, with the Human Rights Commissions, what was depressing to me 
was the number of people. We, and that was with Maclean's, which is the great dentist's waiting room magazine yep. in Canada. It's yep. the equivalent of Time and Newsweek. It's uh, very mainstream. And we, we took the view. We, weren't, we didn't want to argue the, the details of, uh, our, uh, uh, of, of what I'd written because they weren't arguing about. That wasn't what the argument was about. They weren't disagreeing with anything I'd said. They were just saying, you don't have the right to say that. Right. And that's basically what the University of Toronto and the government of Canada uh, is telling you, that you don't have the right to say that. Yes. And the question then is, why do so many people in Canada and other Western countries think that is now a reasonable proposition? I don't think they can believe that it's happening. That's my impression. I, I've got, I would say now, thousands of letters from people in Canada and the US and Australia and all around the world. And, you know, there's two things happening. First of all, people are definitely afraid to say anything. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Half the letters I've got were from people who said, I've been terrified to, to make my opinion on this known. And then people also have no idea that this is actually happening. And then when they hear about it, Conrad Black's response to my, to, my, uh, to my plight, let's say, was a good example of that. He kind of in initially carved a middle road he, and, and sort of downplayed the severity of the law. And I think he, he should know better and then wrote another article you know, more firmly in support of me, but I really don't think that the average person has any idea what's happening. Well, I, I got, and, and Conrad was my uh, old boss in, in Canada for, for years and has served time in federal prison in the United States, so he certainly knows something about the uh, severity of the law. But it, it, his reaction uh, was very familiar to me at the time I ran in, into my difficulties because you get really sick of, uh, and I can understand why you reacted to his moderate course as you did, you, you really get sick of people uh, on the one hand uh, saying, well, of course they support free speech, yep. but on the other, this fellow is a bit excitable and obsessive and we yep. can all agree that he's a bit alarmist and extremist. Yep. And I got, so, I got a lot of that from Globe and Mail columnists and CBC commentators mm. in Canada, all the sensible, nice people. And the, and the fact is that however, however disreputable or obsessive or weird or whatever the target of the anti-free speech people is, uh, you've got to back him or her 100% uh, because otherwise they're going to be they're going to be coming for you next yeah. and that's what they should be doing it doesn't matter whether it's whether the guy seems a bit and and I in a sense I blame myself for that because when these laws first came in and it was some kind of crank who uh, wanted to quote Leviticus uh, in a column against homosexuals you thought well you know what's the big what's the big deal if uh, if they shut him up and, and the fact is that you may think he's a crank and you may think he shouldn't be quoting Leviticus and saying the godless sodomites are going to roast in hell or whatever. But the fact is, if you won't defend that guy, it just moves in, 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 in all the time and suddenly there's no space for public discourse at all, mm -hmm. as you're now discovering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I would say the press in the first couple of weeks, because this has been going on for about two and a half months now, the press in the first couple of weeks was more ambivalent towards my stance but they turned hard behind me right and so that was good yeah um, that's all that's a pattern <laughs> I recognize too it that's like they they don't realize and even and these are people who are in the words business yeah and they don't realize yeah well we take it we take free speech for granted we actually take our whole civilization for granted mm. and we don't understand that that it rests on certain foundation blocks and that if you move those blocks then all hell will break loose and I think that our civilization is a lot more fragile than people really understand, and that it's also much more imperiled than people understand. I mean, I think we made a huge mistake when Salman Rushdie was put under the fatwa, and also we made a huge mistake when, when those Danish cartoons were published. Mm. And we're also in a situation now where your right to say anything critical about religious beliefs, unless they're Christian, fundamentally, mm. Is, is seriously in jeopardy, and that's so dangerous that, that it's, it's almost beyond comprehension. That puts us back in the medieval times. We've been cowed 
Yeah. And and we're cowing ourselves as well with these with these laws that demand equality of opportunity and equality of outcome overall. Um, well, and they were teaching equality of outcome as as a social good to the HR staff at the University of Toronto with, with their mandatory anti-racism and anti-bias training. Equality of outcome, for God's sake. No. Well, the two examples you just mentioned, Salman Rushdie, uh, I think it's pretty clear if he wrote that novel today, he couldn't get that published. Right, uh, right. And, and the cancellations of novels that address Islam has become a routine feature in, in, in the publishing industry. And you mentioned the Danish Mohammed cartoons from 10 years ago. Um, uh, on the 10th anniversary, that newspaper uh, could not publish, republish those cartoons. They'd got the message in, uh, in Denmark. Um, the guys who did keep publishing them at Charlie Hebdo were all killed. Right. So, so, uh, so we have this continuous uh, shriveling of one of the bedrock principles of Western civilization. Mm. Oh, what's and it? you said you said it's a civilizational issue. Mm -hmm. And because I because free speech is the fundamental principle of, of Western civilization. Yeah. I mean, the fundamental principle is logos, roughly speaking. Right. And that's part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And logos is, is the word that turns chaos into order. Yeah. And logos is, our, this, logos is the function of our soul. That's one way of, of thinking about it. The fundamental presupposition of Western civilization is that truth is the best defense against suffering. Right. And that's spoken truth. Right. And it's spoken partly because, well, it's one thing to think. The problem with thinking is that you're blinded by your own biases and preconceptions yeah. and ignorance. But when you speak publicly, then people have a chance to engage you in debate and to improve the speech and to craft it and, and, to, and to refine it and make it more accurate and to reach consensus. And but but, but that, all that presupposes uh, that words still have meaning and, and, and that are the tools with which we communicate are themselves honest and have a certain integrity. So one of the consequences of this great uh, political correctness or whatever you want to call it and people living in fear is that they don't have honest debate and and right. eventually you do reduce yourself to the 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 guys who didn't like the Charlie Hebdo cartoons you're a halfwit who can't argue against it you, you and, and you no longer want to be bothered arguing against it uh, using words to demolish what they're doing. So all you can do is kick the door down and open fire. Yeah, well, the alternative to negotiation is war. Right. And that, that happens at the individual level and at the social level. If you can't talk to people then, and you have a difference of opinion with them, then they're your enemies. And, and combative speech is the replacement for, for actual combat. Yeah. And, you know, real speech is very troublesome and difficult because... It, it can it can unglue people psychologically, you know, but better that than actual violence and and or it's it's partly better that than tyranny and slavery because right. those are really the alternatives. Right, right. It's a toss up which are the sides you. Or the or the this totalitarian thought control mm -hmm. where where the the cure is worse than the. Yeah, well, disease. I I had an interesting example of that when the U of T wrote me the first letter because they they claimed that a lot of they had received a lot of letters stating that my comments about the pronouns had contributed to an unsafe environment at the U of T, you know, and that they had received letters from people who had been threatened. These were transsexual people, hypothetically. But they didn't at all no mention that they had received hundreds of letters from people supporting me and, and also a petition with several thousand signatures. And I thought, because I said, I, I've studied totalitarianism. I've often wondered how societies slide into the big lie and I know it has something to do with sins of omission. And that was a really good example because when they wrote me the letter, they didn't say, you know, we've received uh, yeah, yeah. opinions on both sides of this and we've come to a judicious decision. Yeah, yeah. Omitted completely to note that, that far more people had written in support of me than had written to criticize me. And I thought, well, oh, but yeah, again, well, that's institutional corruption. But again, it, it's, it's this linguistic corruption when people talk about an unsafe space. Yeah. Uh, you know, my late uh, friend uh, Peter Worthington at the Toronto Sun, he enlisted uh, f for, for the uh, Royal Canadian Navy. He lied about his age to get in when he was uh, 14 years old. These guys, you know, the, the, the grandparents of uh, and great-grandparents of these children yep. 
knew that an unsafe space uh, was when you're scrambling ashore uh, on Juneau Beach in uh, Normandy in June 1944. They didn't think an unsafe space was being in a, a, a heated room in Toronto yep. with someone saying something with which you disagree. This yep. is a perversion. Well, I had a debate at the University of Toronto. To their credit, they hosted a debate. And then right at the begin beginning of the debate, there, the announcement came from the administration that there were counselors waiting on hand no. for anyone who was too upset about, yes, too upset about the, you know, about the content of the debate. And I thought, I thought two things about that. I thought that it was terribly sad, and I also thought, well, that's just an indication of how pervasive the politically correct ideology is, because it was a tactical error on the part of the U of T to make that announcement. It just showed how yeah. politically correct the entire mm -hmm. institution was and how appalling. But, you know, I've thought about that, that safe space issue, too, and I think we're also facing something that's a consequence of demographics. You know, people have far fewer children now, and they have mm -hmm. them later, yeah. And so each child is more precious. Right. You know, if there's five children in your family, they sort each other out, right? Because you're raised a lot by your siblings. Yeah. But if you're one child and your mother is 35 when she has you, you're a pretty precious entity. And, and you know, there's a lot riding on you. And, and I think that the, this, the overprotection that's characteristic of this generation is probably a demographic issue as much as a political issue. A, a, a function, yeah, that, they say that's actually one of the uh, differences in uh, Afghanistan and other conflicts, is that uh, a, a nation that has, you know, 1.9 children is fighting a nation that has 9, 10, 11 children, right. and, then ha and therefore has a different view of risk a, a, and so forth. Yes, I think that's, yes. actually, that's, that's actually quite an interesting point. But, but, I mean, to go back to your civilizational point, mm -hmm. Because if uh, a University of Toronto professor had been told what you would, uh, were told in 1957 or 1938, or, you know, actually much more recently, he would have assumed he'd woken up in some kind of alternative universe. Well, that's how it feels to me, that it feels yeah. like I've woken up in some alternative universe. And yeah. I, you know, and obviously this issue is far greater than the pronoun issue, so... My son and I counted newspaper articles about this since the story broke. There's 180 newspaper articles published and millions of people, it might even be 10 million now, have, have watched or listened to the, these accounts on yeah. YouTube. And the idea that this is about pronouns is, is wrong. Because yeah. if it was only about pronouns, it wouldn't have had such a huge effect. Yeah. It's about something, it's often difficult to specify what an argument is about and at what level it needs to be resolved. But this is definitely an argument between free speech or truth, as Jonathan Haidt put it, because yeah. he categorized universities into truth university versus social justice university. Yeah. Put truth university, Chicago, I think, was the top for truth university, right. and Brown for social justice. It's getting a shorter list, the truth universities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, the thing, is, the thing is, too, is that a lot of the dampening of free speech happens invisibly. You know, so, for example, when my students talk about being uncomfortable talking about biological differences between the, the sexes, what that means is they just stop talking about them. Yes. It doesn't mean they make a big show of not, of not talking about them. They just turn their attention to a slightly different topic. No, which, which is, again, one of the weirder aspects of our time, that there are just these subjects that are closed off and people talk about other things. Or, or in the case of religious freedom, they, they, they'll, they'll still do provocative, transgressive things urinating all over Christianity, uh, whereas the great elephant in the room of Islam, uh, that's closed off. Uh, and the more you close it off, the more they say, well, no, I'm a brave transgressive artist. I've, uh, I'm doing, this year I'm doing the Virgin Mary covered in dung. Or mm -hmm. And they, they kind of overcompensate in other areas. It's a, an extremely weird thing. Yeah, well, this, it's the, the alliance between the social justice warrior, the PC authoritarian types, and the and the Islamists is really something mind-boggling to behold. And yeah. the, the only thing that I can think about that makes sense of that is that while the, really, the real radicals on the left who are opposed to the patriarchy, I mean, the patriarchy is Western civilization. Make, make no mistake no. about it. The patriarchy is just a code word for that. And governed by their neo-Marxist dogma and their postmodern dogma, 
they believe that it needs to be retooled right from the bottom up and that's exactly what they're doing and that makes them natural allies, I would say, of any other system that opposes our system. Tom, Tom Wolfe, in his novel uh, a decade, 15 years ago, he wrote a novel about college called I Am Charlotte Simmons. And his view, uh, which I think a lot of people shared back then, is that when uh, the, this, this politically correct approach was being peddled by professors, most students uh, sat at the back of the class, rolling their eyes, pretending to go along with it, and the minute they left university, they tossed it all in the garbage can and reality reasserted itself. And I am not confident that that actually happened. No, no, that doesn't happen. Um, That's partly because the ch children are now taught this sort of thing right from grade seven upward, or even earlier. Like they have this thing in Canada, I I'm sure it's in the United States too, called the gender unicorn or the gender gingerbread yeah. man. Right. So they're basically advertising this ideology to children. And it, that it insists that your four dimensions of, of, of sexual identity, you know, biological, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, are a matter of choice and completely right, independent right, right. from one another. And they're taught that in their, in their health classes and their social justice classes from the time they're very young. Yeah. So, and, and, and the educational establishment signed on to it. The culture signed on to it. What's incredible to me is that um, sports is now the most politically correct field of all, so that Sports Illustrated uh, wants to make uh, Caitlyn Jenner uh, it's, it's, it's kind of model uh, of the year. That's, that's become a very, you're not allowed to notice, notice uh, anything honestly in the same way in, mm. in sports. And uh, in this case, uh, the Parliament of Canada uh, is passing a law that is at odds uh, with eight centuries of its legal inheritance over something that nobody had heard of. Yeah, uh, they don't minutes. care. Well, in the... The, hum the, the social justice tribunals in Ontario, because <clears throat> Ontario is sort of the hotbed of this yeah, yeah, because no. of Kathleen Wynne's government, in, their, in the powers that they've attributed to themselves, they state explicitly that they can dispense with standard Jewish jurisprudential mm. practice and, yeah. and with the adversarial tradition. It states it right in, in the outline of their powers, and they also state that they can take any other action that the tribunal yeah. sees. Absolutely, absolutely. There's no equality before the law. Uh, truth is uh, not a, a defense. You do not is have the uh, traditional uh, balancing uh, of the scales of justice. Uh, and instead, that it's, it's, a, it's a rigged system. But to go, yeah. back, to, to go back, Jordan, because this is what I think some of us uh, in the dark night of the soul at three in the morning are beginning to wonder. You talked about it in civilizational terms. Mm -hmm. um, we, we face real challenges uh, around the world. You mentioned the demographic thing. People have one little yuppie designer baby at 39, uh, and meanwhile around the world, people are having zillions of kids by the time they're 23, 24. In a democratic age, those differences will eventually become dispositive. Um, and we have a situation. We have a situation um, where there are profound geopolitical challenges that we have to address. Yet, uh, the most absurd issues suddenly become the test of whether you're a moral person now. Like which bathrooms you let which people use. The uh, a subject on which uh, the federal government of the United States uh, deems fit to weigh in on. Um, and as you say, there is this gender spectrum now, so that you don't even have to. Before sex changes used to be a, 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 a sex change. However, whatever one thought about it, you had to go with uh, taking uh, male body parts and removing them and putting uh, some kind of female body parts in their place. Now people live on, on the spectrum. They can have... Uh, uh, breast uh, hormones, so they'll grow breasts, but they still keep a penis. And that's a kind of valid identity that a lot of... Uh, right, uh, it's a woman's people, penis, according yes. to the social justice and you see, org. Yeah, and you see her penis in the headlines. Yeah. Uh, New York, the New York Post headline, 
uh, Caitlyn Jenner still has her penis. Her penis was not something that tabloid headline writers had to worry about until a few years ago. The lady who wrote the vagina monologues, big feminist hero, for 20 years she had a great run. Yeah. Now uh, that play is not being produced at uh, American campuses because they say it's ghastly, it's uh, hateful for her to imply uh, that you have to have a vagina to be a woman. Yep. So she's transified her play and put a scene in there about a trans woman who still has, quote, her penis mm -hmm. in there. And you put it in civilizational terms. Yeah, and well, I'd, I'd, like, I'd, I'd just like to put it to you as basically as possible. I mean, is the jig up for us? Is this how it ends? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that this, this transgressive behavior that you're describing is part of the all-out assault on Western categories of thought. And I think that that was started not even so much by the Marxists as by the French intellectuals of the late 1960s, especially Jacques Derrida, who maybe is the most dangerous person of the last 40 years. And he's, of course, the hero of the humanities and much of the social sciences. Right. And he believes that, and states this in his work, that the whole purpose of categorization is for exclusion. And so the, that... And categorization is the basis of cognition. Yeah. And so he basically has made the claim that thought itself is an agent of oppression. Right. And that, that's absurd, except that he's the dominant thinker. Yeah. And, and I don't think people, I know people don't understand how radical and transgressive the universities actually are and how deeply embedded mm -hmm. this sort of thinking is in them. And this gender issue is a screen as far as I'm concerned. And it's a screen for, which is why it's got so much attention. It's a screen for an all-out assault, and that assault started back in the late 60s. It, it started when the Marxists transformed themselves into postmodernists, roughly speaking, when, when they realized that their working-class utopia, when they finally realized after decades of denial that their working-class utopias in the Soviet Union, for example, were absolutely murderous and reprehensible empires, they transferred their, their thinking to identity politics and carried on their merry way. Right, right, which is, which is there's, um, there's a useful American expression, um, uh, I don't need this in my life right now, and uh, that's how a lot of people feel about this. Yeah, I can uh, understand that. They that. don't want to, they don't, why should, uh, why should this or that person have to take on this ban? Yeah. And, and the, the, my that, colleague question, said, that question applies uh, to you too. I mean, you've my colleagues have... told me this is one of the reasons that I made the video to begin with. I had a colleague tell me that you know he's he's very worried about the encroachment of political correctness in on the campuses. But he said he wasn't sure what to do about it because if he stood up against it, the personal the personal cost would be overwhelming and the social effect would be negligible. Right. And I thought, God, that's such a horrible thing to think. But I, I mean, I, I took it seriously, right? I mean, it yeah, was a yeah. serious thing for him to say. Yeah. And. You know, I mean, there's more than a small part of me that wishes I'd never hit this particular hornet's nest with a bat. Yeah. But the reason I did it was because I believe it will be worse later. Yeah. That's why. And I do believe that. And I think we're in far worse shape than we think. Because we've made so many incremental concessions already. Yeah. Because it's easier, always easier to surrender an inch at a time. Well, and when you, the thing is, too, is like what happened when I, when I made my, let's call it, stance for free speech, I was immediately accused of being both a transphobe and a, and a racist because right. I had made some negative comments about this group called the Black Lives Collective, yeah. I think that's the name of them, um, who, who are run by two reprehensible people in yeah. my estimation. And the university had been taking policy advice for them even though they were perfectly willing to promote violence in the, in the service of social change. I was objecting to that. And the thing is, is that as the politically correct movement inches forward, there's always a vulnerable group that they're using as a, as a, as a just like the terrorists do in the Middle yeah. East, you know, they'll surround, they'll surround their hideout with women and children. So right. if you bomb the hideout, you kill these innocent yeah. people. Yeah. Well, the, the social justice warrior types do exactly the same thing. Yeah. They find a hypothetically vulnerable group, it doesn't yeah. matter what it is, and then they use them as a protective shield while they move incrementally forward. Yep. And so if you object, then immediately you're targeted as someone who's picking on the poor, vulnerable people. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard through the grapevine that, you know, I have support among the faculty, although you'd never know that by their <laughs> actions. Yeah. Um, but basically, the faculty's um, net, net conclusion is that, well, you know, what you're saying is right, but you could have been a lot nicer about it. And, yeah. and 
and and and pay no attention and pay no attention to that. I mean, I I had all that, and my friend uh, Ezra Levant had all that when he uh, republished the Danish Muhammad cartoons. And the fact is that if you if you are nice and sensible and you play footsie with them. Uh, the whole racket stays in place. And it's only because uh, Ezra Levant, in particular, just decided to go nuclear uh, on these human rights commissions that we wound up getting uh, that law repealed at the federal, uh, at the federal level. Yeah, well, that was least. quite a fight. Um, and, but you need the guy. Uh, you need the guy who's going to go crazy and who's going to go nuclear. And so all the things that, that Conrad Black said about you are, in fact, the reason why you have become a lightning rod for this mm -hmm. issue and why you need, why you absolutely uh, need to do that. Yeah, well, I've tried to think through that, you know, mm -hmm. why, why this caused so much attention, because lots of people have made statements, you know, decrying political correctness, but I believe the reason was because I actually said there was something I would not do. Right. And so I drew a line, so right. to speak, and... And it was that combination of generality, you know, warning about political correctness and specificity that made the, made the issue real for people. And ju just finally here, I mean, you, you, you don't like to see this in, like, crude left-right uh, politically partisan. No, it's deeper than that. Um, but, but it is a general proposition, is it not, that if you meet someone who is um, opposed to... Uh, gay marriage, say, uh, there's someone who is opposed to gay marriage. He, uh, he's not someone who's opposed to you arguing in favor of gay marriage. Mm -hmm. He just wants the right to argue his corner, too. Mm -hmm. The left, on the other hand, uh, isn't really interested in your argument against gay marriage. They're actually now saying you do not have the right to make an argument That's right. against gay marriage. Absolutely, and, and that many is, other arguments. Yes, and that is... Because it's discriminatory. Yeah. And, and, that, and, the, and the domain of what constitutes discriminatory is, is yeah, magnifying yeah. constantly. And, and people under... Uh, at, at, at a certain point, the, le the left still paid uh, lip service to that apocryphal bit of Voltaire, I disagree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say mm. it. Nobody, talk, nobody even pretends to go... No, 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 and many of the kids on the left regard arguments. They equate arguments in favor of free speech with racism. They just right. assume they're the same thing. Right, right, which is, again, why destroying language has been, in turn, so destructive. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, support this man, support this man, because he's engaged in an important battle. And as I said, it is the bedrock issue because uh, unless we win on the free speech thing, unless we have a culture of genuine, vigorous debate on these issues, um, then none of the other issues matter because there will only be an official state ideology. And, and free people should be opposed to official state ideology regardless whether it's fascism, communism, uh, or about climate change and transgendered bathroom. The minute it becomes the official position and the only one you're allowed to hold, uh, you should be opposed to it and, uh, and support Jordan Peterson. Uh, you've got to be tough to, to take what's come in your way, Jordan, and, uh, and I salute you. It's not an easy battle, and you're doing a great thing. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's all the civilizational collapse we have time for today. See you next time.